the title of our message this afternoon is Preparation for God's Destiny. Preparation for God's Destiny. As you and I know, Hossein Bolt is like the world, you know, he beat so many records, won so many, you know, competitions. He was a great athlete. And there was, an, uh, there was a competition that took place, and it only was 100 meters, okay? And to get there, it took him less than 10 seconds, and he won and, you know, beat the record and everything. But what's so interesting is that many people understand that it's not the performance that led him to win that battle, but it was the preparation. It was many hours and hours, sweat, tears, even self-doubt, a lot of things that he has gone through to let him to that very moment to win and get the gold. But many people don't understand that it took a lot of sacrifice. It took a lot of pain. It, it took a lot of endurance and even rehab and even patience to lead to where he was able to win that, that uh, gold medal. And the same thing is for us. In our destiny with God, it's not like automatic that you're going to get there. You're going to go through a series of tough moments, of testing, of trial and tribulation to where it will eventually lead you to the ultimate purpose of God in your life. Amen? And God has a purpose for you. All the pain, the betrayal, the hurt, everything that you've gone through is part of the process, part of the preparation of what God wants to do in your life. And sometimes we don't like the preparation. We want things right away. But God's saying, no, I got to prepare you for your destiny. Because if I were to give you and lead you straight to your destiny, you wouldn't be ready for it. Your character wouldn't be in the right place. Your faith is not in the right place. And your motives is not in the right place. So therefore, I have to prepare you and to make sure you're ready for God's promised land. Just like the Israelites, God promised them to go to the promised land, but the thing is, he took them to the wilderness first. There was a lot of testing, a lot of trials, and guess what? That generation was, wasn't able to reach the promised land, only the next generation. Why didn't that generation reach it? Because they kept complaining, they kept grumbling, their attitude and character wasn't in the right place. And I'm here to let you know that God is not blown away by your talent. He's not blown away by how much money you have. He's not blown away by, you know, how many followers you have, how many people like you. What matters to God is your character, your character and your relationship with him. And if your character and your relationship with him is not in the right place, God needs to do some work in your heart, in your soul, to prepare you for the promised land. Amen? So God already prepared the way. He just, he is just preparing you. So remember that God has already prepared the way. Okay, there's feedback. Hopefully that helps. Okay, there you go. God has already prepared the way. He is just preparing you. Remember that. Okay? So your life, it's coming again. I hear it. It's like a, ooh, I'm about to come. <laughs> It's just a volume. Okay, great. Thank you. So your life experiences are preparations for God's destiny. Once again, your life experiences are preparations for God's destiny. Okay? So number one is this. Your background has prepared you for God's destiny. If you guys could say with me, your background has prepared you for God's destiny. Your background, where you came from, your, um, your DNA, your family background, the circumstances that you were in, whether you were poor, whether you're rich, whether you grew up in a broken family, whether you grew up in a good family, all of that that you've gone through in your background is preparation for your future and what God wants to do. Example of this is Pharaoh's daughter finds baby Moses in the Nile River because during that time, the Egyptians and Pharaoh was intimidated by the Israelites because they were growing in number. They felt like they were going to take control and take over. So what he did is he put this mandate that he, all the baby boy who were born from the Hebrew women are to throw them into the Nile River. Throw them to the Nile River. 
So what happens is God has a plan and destiny for Moses. So therefore, who finds Moses? Pharaoh's daughter. So it's not a coincidence that Moses was put into the Nile River and found by Pharaoh's daughter. There was a purpose. There was a destiny in line for that to take place. Secondly, Moses was raised by two different mothers, okay? He was raised by his own mother and also by Pharaoh's daughter. So he has two mothers. And what's interesting is there are two different lifestyles because Moses' mother, Hebrew mother, was poor, was going through a lot of injustice, a lot of, you know, issues because of their own people was being oppressed by the Egyptians. So she was poor. She wasn't in a prestigious um, lifestyle. And Moses lived with her. And he's seen the injustice. He's seen what the Hebrew people were going through by the Egyptians. And next thing you know, later on in life, he ended up being, you know, raised by his second mother, which is, you know, the, the daughter of Pharaoh. So he sees how it is to be prestigious, to be rich, to be in power, to be in control. So he sees both sides. And God used that in preparation for his future. Because what happened was Moses saw his own people before he ended up being the leader of the Israelites. He saw his own people being abused as slaves. Okay? So in that situation, you know, he even kills an Egyptian, you know, to, to free this man, okay, who was, who was being oppressed and abused by the Egyptian. So Hebrew, so we see here that God was brewing within Moses compassion and love towards God's people, knowing that later on in life, it wasn't at this moment, but later on in life, God was going to use everything that he has gone through in the past to prepare him for what God wants to do, which is eventually lead the Israelites out of slavery, out of Egypt, into the promised land. Amen? So God's going to do the same with you. Everything that you've gone through, the good and the bad, the background where you came from, is preparation for what God wants to do in your life today. The same goes for me because I know for a fact I grew up in a broken home. I grew up where I didn't have, you know what I mean, the, the best of a, of, of a background. But God is using it today because I'm able to help many people who have gone through brokenness, who have gone through a place where you, you know, you were, you lived in an, another country where you felt like you're in another family and everything. I know how that feels. And everything that I've gone through, even though I didn't like what happened, but I know it's part of the process because God wanted to build within me compassion and love for those who didn't have their parents in their life. Who, who went through bullying, went through brokenness, went through so, some hardships in life. I'm able to help them, you see? So God has a purpose for it. I know there's stuff in your past that you wish you just want to erase, like you don't want to bring up, you don't want to talk about. But the truth is, God wants you to talk about it. He wants you to bring it up because there's people out there who need to hear it. Amen? There's people out there who, who are going to be healed by your story. They're going to be healed by what you've gone through. And guess what? Find God through your story, through what you went through. Second, another story is David. You see, the background is when Saul became king, the first king in, in, in Israel, he made some bad choices which led him, which led Samuel to look for another king. And as he was looking for another king, when he went to Jesse's house, he was expecting the eldest to be the next one in line to be king because he was tall, he was handsome, he had the characteristics and everything. But no, he wasn't the king. So Jesse sent his other son, and then Samuel says, no, God says he's not the king. And then so he sends his other son and presents him before Samuel, and Samuel says, no, he's not the king. After several of his kids were passed before Samuel, finally you know, Samuel's like, do you have any other kids? And he's like, oh, wait, I do have one more. He's tending the sheep. So then next thing you know, you know, he brings David before Samuel, and then Samuel says, this is the next king. David was overlooked by his own family. And you were probably overlooked by your own mom, your dad, by your siblings, by your, your, your teacher, by your coworkers, by your boss. But I'm here to let you know God never looks, overlooks you, but he looks upon you. Amen? Amen? That God's eyes is upon you. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're, you're not good enough, if you feel like you're not popular, if you feel like people don't look down on you or they, they don't think that you're capable. I want you to know that God looks upon you and says, yes, 
I will use you. I will empower you, and I have great things ahead for you because your faith is upon me, because you look upon me. Even though the people around you say you're small, you're weak, you're nobody, God says, no, you have, you have me. Therefore, you have everything you need to fulfill your destiny and dream in your life. Amen? And next is this. David killed a lion and a bear before he faced Goliath. A lot of people don't realize this, but before the battle with the, you know, the, the, the most epic scene in, in, in the Bible, which is known all over the world, the David Goliath story, a lot of people don't understand that he actually faced a lion and a bear before he faced Goliath. So God prepared him for the battle that is to come. So everything that you've gone through from till this very moment, God has prepared you for it. God has prepared you, and he has empowered you, and he has blessed you so you can come out of this in victory. Amen? Amen. That you're not going to come out of this in defeat, but in victory because you have God with you. Even though it seemed like David could not defeat Goliath because of his stature, because he, his experience, but he had God with him. And I want you to know, even if you have a Goliath-sized problem in your life, you have a Goliath-sized issue that you're facing at the moment, as you put your faith in Jesus just like David did, you will see God's breakthrough and you will see his miraculous take place. Another figure in scripture is Esther. Remember this, Esther didn't grow up with her parents, but she grew up raised by her uncle. And that must have been really hard and difficult for her, but she was able to find her identity and purpose and God still used her. Can you think of, can you imagine this? Because she was just a Jewish lady, okay? A Jewish woman and she's in Persia in a totally different culture, totally different, you know, type of people and everything. But next thing you know, during that time, the queen of Persia made a mistake which dethroned her position. So next, they were looking for the next queen to be. And it so happens Esther was there. And she, so she ends up becoming queen. Can you believe that? Even though she didn't have her mom or dad to raise her up. So, and there's some of you in that position too where you didn't have your parents with you. You probably didn't have the love and, and the care that you would want, but yet God still brought you here today. God has still blessed you today, and God has a purpose for you today. And next is this, Jesus. Jesus, did you guys know he chose the least likely people to be his disciples? A lot of people don't know this, but another thing is during Jesus' era, if you weren't following a rabbi, that means you, were, you, that means you didn't achieve the ultimate dream. Because in the Jewish culture, the ultimate dream during that time is to follow a rabbi. And the thing is, the disciples were not following any rabbi. They were just doing their uh, fishermen, tax collectors. They had these uh, regular jobs around. So these were the people who were overlooked. These were the people who weren't prestigious. These were the people who were not, uh, and who were not educated. They were, these, these people were, were people that you wouldn't even choose or pick, but God chose them, you see? So even though they were the least likely one in society, God chose them. Same thing with us. Even if your mom, dad overlooked you, other people overlooked you, God has never overlooked you. He looks upon you with favor, with grace, and empowerment, and he wants to use everything that you've gone through. What am I saying here? I'm not saying your background defines your future. What I'm saying is your background prepares you for the future. Amen? That's a whole different thing. Because a lot of people think, oh, no, I was born and raised in a broken home. Therefore, my life is going to be broken too. No. But the background is you went through all of that mess, all of that chaos, all that troubles, so that you are prepared for what God wants to do ahead. Amen? And not follow that footsteps. God's going to use your background to transform so that it becomes a beautiful Tra transformative testimony of what God can do. Amen? That's why. Don't, I'm not saying don't overlook your background. It's part of the story. Your background plays a huge part in what God wants to do for today. So don't be mad at it. Don't say, you know what, I, I want to forget about it. No, it's part of the story. And God's going to change your background in, into a beautiful masterpiece, into a beautiful story as you make God the author of your life, okay? I don't know why I became small. I made a mistake here. But the last point I want to share this afternoon is this. Your toughest moments has prepared you for God's destiny. Can you say it with me? Your toughest moments 
has prepared you for God's destiny. One more time, your toughest moments has prepared you for God's destiny. Okay, Abraham was about to sacrifice his only promised son. Just think of this. Abraham was in a position in his life where he's been waiting for many, many, many years for his promised son. And after quite some time, finally he receives this promised child. And God says, out of your son Isaac you're, is going to um, come through the promise of descendants that is as numerous as the stars of the sky. That is going to come through Isaac. However, God tested the love of Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your only son. And Abraham, without hesitation, went to the mountain and was about to sacrifice him. But God says, no, 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 I don't, we don't do that. We don't practice that. But you prove to me at this moment, Abraham, that you love me more than you love your promised son. So therefore, since you passed that test, now the, the blessing and, and that I, the promise that I made to you is going to come to fruition. So I'm here to let you know that, yes, you're going to go through trials. You're going to go through times of testing. And my prayer is that you won't get mad at the test, that you won't despise the test, but you will look at it as God's plan. Because a lot of people see life as problems. But God says, no, I don't see life as problems. I see them as plans. And I want us to really transform how we see and perceive life. These trials and, and problems and situations that you face are not meant to break you, but they're meant to make you. Amen? They're meant to mold you. They're meant to change you. They're meant to, to make you to become a better person in character and also in how you deal with relationships. Because there's so many people who are so vulnerable and so... Um, Delicate. What I mean by this, there's some people where they, their, their self-esteem is so, is, is, is so grounded in how the other person perceives them. And sometimes you're going to have to go through breakups. You're going to have to go through some um, tough situations to where you will end up saying, you know what? I'm not going to find my value in you, but I'm going to find it in God. Amen? And sometimes God needs to put you in those relationships to really align yourself to God. Because before, I struggled with my self-esteem. Because like I mentioned, I didn't grow up in a family where, yes, JP, you're doing a great job, keep it up. Um, I'll come to all your competitions and, and you know, support you. I didn't, I didn't have that growing up. So whenever, um, as a kid, I struggled with self-esteem. So whenever people just say little things about me, I get offended, I get really hurt, and I really get down on myself. But then God showed me, hey, JP, your true value and your true worth is found in me, not in any girl, not in any perception of other people. And God had to let me go through that in order to really find myself and ground myself in God. Amen? So you are going to go through hardships. You're going to go through trials. You're going to go through breakups. You're going to go through issues in your life that you probably don't want to, but it's part of the process the preparation that God wants to do in your life in order to take you to where he wants to use you. Amen? So next is this, Joseph. Ooh, very popular. I always talk about this story because this story is, is such an inspirational story and it really speaks life into what God can do. Remember Joseph. His brothers actually wanted to kill him. His brothers wanted to, you know, they're conspiring together of how to kill him. But instead, one of the brothers says, you know what, let's just sell him as a slave. And still, that is terrible for your own family to sell you out. Have you experienced that before? Where your own family, your own brothers, your own family you would trust and love will sell you out. That's exactly what happened to Joseph. He was sold out by his, his own brothers. And yes, it was hurtful. Yes, he felt betrayed. He felt abandoned. He felt unloved. I was very hurtful for him but he didn't know a lot of people didn't realize that God allowed that to happen because God wanted to serve a greater purpose for him let's continue on Joseph was put in prison for false rape allegations he didn't commit rape he didn't touch this woman which is Potiphar's wife because at that time Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with him and and you know Joseph's like no I'm not gonna do that you know Potiphar's my boss I'm not going to go behind his back and sleep with you. And, and, but she kept nagging in him, like, time after time, trying to have him fall into that trap. But he's like, no, I'm not going to do it. He ran away. She grabbed hold of his, his, 
his cloak, and she told her, her husband and everyone, hey, he tried to rape me. He tried to sexually harass me. So he was put in prison for something he didn't do. But God used that situation to lead him so that he could meet Pharaoh and interpret his dream and become second in power in all of Egypt. You see that? So God's going to use the hurt, the betrayal, the hardship, all the stuff that you've gone through in preparation to where God wants to lead you and guide you. Amen? Next is this, which is hard. Joseph had to face his brothers again. His, the very brothers who sold him out, who wanted to kill him, he had to face them again many, many years. Why is that? Because there was a severe famine and there's no place to find food. The thing is, when Joseph met Potter, uh, Pharaoh and interpreted his dream in jail, he was able to be released from that and become second in power so that he could help mil millions of people from the famine that is to take place. So for seven years, there was, a, uh, there was prosperity. So they're able to save up so much food that the only place that you can get food is in Egypt. So his family went to Egypt. His brothers went to Egypt seeking for food. And next thing you know, who did they see? Joseph. Joseph recognized them, but they didn't even recognize Joseph. And right there at that moment, it was really hurtful for Joseph. At first, he was mean to them. He, he put some of them in jail for a little bit. He, and he was, he was mean to them because he was still carrying the hurt. He was carrying the pain of what his brothers had done to him. And then finally, he had enough of it and revealed himself, hey, brothers, it was so hurtful what you've done for me, done to me. But the thing is, God used the very evil that you thought to do to me and used it for a greater good so that I can help my family come here to Egypt and my dad and also help millions of people who are starving. So what you meant for evil, God used it for good. Amen? So there's people who have meant evil against you, but I'm here to let you know God's going to use it for good. Amen? He's going to use it for good. God used Samson. Here's another figure in the Bible. Despite his sins and imperfections, the thing is, his destiny calling was to deliver the, the Israelites from the oppression of the Philistines. Because the Philistines were oppressing the people, and his goal was to really release them from out of that. And the thing is, during this time, the Israelites are taught all their life, you can only marry an Israelite. Don't ever marry outside the race, outside this culture, outside this group. But the thing is, Samson loved Philistine women. He lusted over them. He loved the prostitutes. He was very, he was a womanizer, okay? Plainly, that's who he was. And God still used his imperfections to, to, to bring about his purpose. Yes, he went through a lot of hardship. He went through a lot of trial. He went through a lot of pain because of his lust for these, for these women. And ultimately, you guys know the story with Delilah. Delilah was like, trying to find out the secret of why he's strong. Because Samson was the strongest man in scripture. And he was killing a lot of the Philistines. And he was so strong that the Philistines were afraid of him. And then finally, because of his vulnerability, because he loved these women so much, he gave the secret to his strength. So they cut his hair, and he was weak as a bird, or as a chicken. And then from there on, they gudged out his eyes. He became blind. And he was at the lowest point of his life. He was at the, the lowest point because he lost everything. He lost his strength. He lost his wife. He was in the dungeon of a palace. But God still had a purpose for him because where he was at was the foundation of the whole palace. And there was thousands and thousands of people that were there. So finally his hair grew a little bit. And finally he said, God, give me this one time at this moment to, to take vengeance on these people. So finally... He was able, through God's strength, boom, move the pillar of the palace, and a lot of the Philistines were killed at that moment. And that was part of the plan of God, is to, to release the people from the hold of the Philistines. So God still used Samson, even though he was imperfect, even though he was a womanizer, even though he lusted, he still had a purpose in his life. And God still will use us. And I want you to know that even if you made mistakes in your life, God's grace is there to forgive you. God's grace is to give you hope. God's grace is there to restore you. Yes, you will go through the consequences. It's part of it when you step outside of God's direction. However, there's still redemption. There's still healing. 
and God can still use you like what he was able to do with Samson. Esther saved the Jews from being destroyed. Like I mentioned earlier, Esther, God allowed her to become queen of all of Persia. And the thing is, Haman wanted all the Jews to be eliminated and killed because they didn't want to bow down. One of them didn't want to bow down to him. So he's like, I want all these Jews to be eliminated, to, to, be, to be extinct, to be destroyed. And so finally, the queen approaches the king and says, hey, can you please release my people and not let them be destroyed? And through her influence, and because God put her in that position, she was able to save many Jews from being killed and destroyed that day. So look at that. Even though she came from a background, not having her parents around, God still used her in, in a powerful way to save many people. And David was able to defeat Goliath. Just think of that. God prepared him. Because in the past, he, had, he, he faced lions and bears, so he's able to defeat Goliath. Same with you and I. Whatever you're facing today, because God is with you, you're going to, God's going to refine you and guide you and mold you to prepare you for the destiny ahead. And last but not least is Daniel. This man, Daniel, in the Bible, he refused to worship or bow down to the king during that time. And they said, hey, if you don't worship and bow down to this king, you're going to be thrown into the den of lions. And the thing is, he refused to bow down to any person. And so what did he do? He was thrown into the den of, of lions. And the thing is this, God was with him, and he did the right thing by worshiping God and not letting anyone, anyone else or anything else take the place of God. So what did God do? He shut the mouth of the lions, and he was able to be released from the den of lions. Because if, if I was in the den of lions, that's scary, you know, to be even near lions. And God sent an angel to shut their mouths and allow him to be safe and to be free. And those very people who tried to do that to him were thrown into the lion's den and they died. So what am I trying to say? Your toughest moments are preparations for God's destiny. Your toughest moments. You went through a lot for 21, 2020. There's a lot of things that you've gone through. But I want you to know it's preparation for what God wants to do ahead. Amen? So don't give up. Don't give up. Don't throw the towel. Don't throw, throw the white flag. It's, it's for us to be reminded that, hey, whatever problems come my way, I know it's God preparation, God's preparation for what God wants to do in my life. It's not a, a plan to destroy you, but it's a plan to make you, to mold you, to guide you, to build you up to what God wants to do. So remember this. Corey Ten Boom said, every experience God gives us, every person he puts in our lives is the perfect preparation for the future only he can see. So every experience that you've gone through, the people that God put in your life, is perfect preparation for the future only he can see. God is aligning and guiding your way. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies wouldn't remain in the cross on the Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came about blood and water. So this is this whole passage here was speaking about what happened after the death of Jesus. So it says, since it was a day of preparation so that the bodies wouldn't remain on the cross on the Sabbath. So what am I trying to say is that, remember, Jesus was at the cross, but did he remain in the cross? No. He was placed in a tomb, and in three days he rose, right? So same thing with you. Even though you felt like you're in the cross, you felt like people are, are <laughs> crucifying you, betraying you, hurting you, doing you wrong, you're not going to remain there forever. Amen? Just like Jesus didn't remain at the cross. So look what it says in 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear at once. There came about blood and water. So there's some of you, like I mentioned, like you felt like people are just betraying you, hurting you, doing you wrong. It's like people backstabbing you, hurting you. But I'm here to let you know that's a temporary place. That place that you're in or you felt you're in is not forever. Amen? Just like Jesus was crucified, he didn't remain at the cross. But he rose and conquered death. So same thing with you and I. 
Like you, that, that season that you're in where you felt betrayed, you felt like you're hurt, you felt like everyone's against you, that's temporary because it's part of the process of what God wants to do in your life. Just like Joseph, remember this. Joseph had to face his brothers again. For what reason? To forgive them. So God's going to put you in a place where you need to forgive. I'm not saying that you have to trust them again. You've got to be best friends again. But the key thing is that you forgive them in your heart every time you think about them. Every time they come to mind, you forgive them. Like, Lord, I forgive them. God, give me the strength to forgive them. I forgive them at this moment. There's a reason why they keep popping in your mind. You know what I mean? So God wants to release you from that. That's the reason why they come to your mind. And every time they do come to mind, keep forgiving them. And then when the time comes, God will make it happen where you see each other or you finally release, get healed and released from that situation. Because I had a fallout with my dad. You know, years ago, it was a bad situation. We were not talking. I had a lot of resentment and anger towards him. And then I just told God, God, I don't like feeling this way. I don't like having to think about it because it is affecting me. It's affecting my mood. It's affecting everything. I said, God, give me the mo the, that, that time where I could reconcile and be released from this. And after quite some time, it was like months, okay? And then finally God allowed us to reconcile. It was, I'll never forget it. It was a moment we both cried. I forgave him. He forgave me. It was, it was a time that, you know, it was a place of healing. It's a season of healing. So I'm, I'm not saying you force forgiveness. I'm not saying you force that for you to reconcile, that's not something you got to do. Your role is to just release them and forgive them now. And in God's time, he will allow you guys to reconcile. Amen? It's God's time. So you don't have to force it. God will make it happen. The key thing is for you to keep releasing them in your mind, releasing them in your heart. Because God doesn't want it to be there. God doesn't want you to carry the hatred, the resentment, the anger, the bitterness. God wants you to forgive and be released. Because if you don't forgive and release, guess what? you won't have peace. If you don't forgive and release, you won't have joy. You won't have life. The enemy will continually steal away the joy of the Lord in you, and that's not of God, amen? God wants you to be a person that's full of love, full of joy, and full of peace, amen? That's the three things I don't want the enemy to take away from me, and that's the thing I constantly try to do every day, is to forgive and let go. So God isn't ignoring you. Remember that. He is preparing you, amen? Because some people think he's ignoring, like, God, I've been praying for this. I've been seeking you. I haven't seen the breakthrough yet. But God's saying, wait, wait, my child. He's not ignoring you. He's aligning things in place. Your current situation, like I mentioned, is not your final destination. It's not your final destination. Your current situation is a temporary season that you're in that you'll eventually get out of. Okay? So enjoy and make the best of the moment because that season is not going to be there forever, okay? What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Amen? If God is for you, no one can be against you. So that's why you got to just forgive and let go because God is the one who's in control of your life and he's the one who will lead and bless you. They are not, they don't have a hold over your life, Amen? They don't have a hold in your life. All those people who have hurt you, done you wrong, they don't have a hold in your life. But you will put, you will let them have a hold in your life if you don't forgive. That's the key thing. If you don't forgive and let go, they will continually have a hold in your mind, in your heart, in your attitude, in your character, unless you release and forgive them. So, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Amen? So if you love God, it's going to work out. Even though you didn't like what you've gone through, the mess, the hurts, and all that, but God will use it for your good, for your good. Remember that. For as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Amen? God has prepared a great destiny for your life. Okay? And what I mean by that, not everyone's going to have the same, you know, story. We're all going to have go through different stories, and we're all going to have different platforms. Some of us are going to be entertainment. Some of us are going to be music. Some of us are going to be in ministry. Some of us are going to be doctors, lawyers, police officers, in government. We're all going to be placed in different platforms. But understand that. It's to achieve God's destiny in your life. And some of you are going to have a Jesus-like destiny where it's not going to be 
the most um, greatest story of achievement, but it's going to be a, a, a destiny of sacrifice, of giving your life for other people, just like what Jesus has done. You know, and some of you, yes, it's gonna, it, we're all going to have different stories. That's the key thing. Not all of us are going to be the same. And destiny doesn't necessarily mean just success and prosperity and, and, and have it well. No. What I mean is God's destiny is going to look different for all of us. But the key thing is, the main thing is you live it out. Whatever God has destined for your life that you say, God, I'm, I'm saying yes to it. Whether I like it or not, I know it's your plan and purpose in my life. And I'm going to live it out, God, in Jesus' name. So the Lord's work in us is preparation for the work he wants to do through us. The Lord's work in us is preparation for the work he wants to do through us. So he's preparing us. He's preparing for us for what's ahead. Get ready, amen? Get ready for what's ahead. I like this one by Tony Evans. He says, don't worry about locating your purpose. Because there's a lot of people like, I don't know my purpose. I don't know why God put me here. This is what you need to do. Don't worry about locating your purpose. If you are seeking after God, your purpose will locate you. Amen? Amen? Don't worry about locating your purpose. If you are seeking after God, your purpose will locate you. You will find your purpose when you find God. Amen? When you know God, you will know your purpose. And I like what Corey Ten Boom said. God has plans, not problems, for our lives. Remember that. God has plans, not problems for our lives. The life of a Christian is an education for a higher service. God is training you for something. So I want you to see life as a training ground. Everything that you've gone through is training you for what God wants to do in your life. And last but not least, Lisa Breve said this. Obstacles do not prevent you from your calling. They prepare you for it. Amen? Obstacles do not prevent you from your calling. They prepare you for it. God's preparing you. He's preparing you. He's not trying to put something in the way of what God wants to do in your life, but it's preparation for what God wants to do ahead. So nothing happens by, by accident. God is preparing you for great things. Nothing happens by accident. God is preparing you for great things. Do you believe that? Amen. So remember, number one, your background has prepared you for God's destiny. Everything that you've gone through in the past, okay? Your toughest moments has prepared you for God's destiny. So if we could all uh, bow our heads and close our, our eyes and let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for the reminder this afternoon, Lord, that our background, the toughest moments in our life, is preparation for our destiny. So Jesus, help us not to be discouraged or fearful, not to uh, be mad about it, but to be, Lord, I'm expecting that you're going to do great things ahead. I might not like what I went through, Lord. It was hurtful. It was painful. But I know, God, it's part of the process of what you want to do in my life and the destiny and plan you have for me. So, God, I choose to accept everything that has happened to me. Whether I came from a good background or a bad background, I know, God, it's part of the process, Lord. Even though I didn't like the sickness that I went through, the pain that I went through, the betrayal that I went through, God, I accept it that it's part of what you want to do and use for your glory. So Jesus, I pray, God, that you give me the strength and the courage to accept the things that has happened in the past, knowing that it is used in preparation for what you want to do for my future. So Jesus, we choose to forgive all those who have offended us, who've done us wrong. We choose to forgive, Lord. We choose to embrace and accept every mistake we've made, all the hardships, all the trials. We know, Jesus, that you have used it to change us, to transform us, to help us to become better people, and also to be wiser in our relationships. Thank you, God, that you've taught us to really find our value in you. You've taught us, oh Lord, to forgive and let go. you taught us, knowing that all the stuff that I've gone through has built me up to know you has built me up to grow in my faith in you, has built me up to where I am today. So thank you, God, that you have great things in store for 22. And God, I know you are with me through the trials, through the storms, through the, diff through the victories and through the hardships. I know, God, through you, I can do all things. And God's people said, amen.
the NASB version. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 1 Timothy 6.17 Teach those who are rich in the world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. 2 Corinthians, lastly, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. He's given us most abundantly. Let us, as we prepare for our tithes, you can give through Get Tithely or in the back of, in the narthex. Uh, Let's prepare our hearts to give God our tithings and our offerings. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful message for the wonderful new year. It's a fresh beginning, Father, for these days of many days of rain, Father. Father, prepare our hearts to give you as abundantly as you have given us, you have given us, that you may, we may reap the opportunity to be blessed by you, Father. I thank you, Father. Bless our church. Bless the saints among us and with us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. <laughs>